Welcome, family and friends. Where's Linda? Okay. Oh, people have come from far and wide, East Coast, West Coast, everywhere in between. I think that Keith is saying to me, are you now glad you moved to Tennessee? <laughs> what is with this? It was in the 80s when we left Nashville. So whatever, right, Tim? <laughs> so, so glad you could all be here. Um, Keith would be humbled. Uh, if you have not ever been to a Grocer or Grownwald event, I have to warn you, we have a lot to say. <laughs> so this will be a little long, probably, for some of you. Um, and so we're leaving the bar and the food open, and uh, you've got to go to the bathroom, go. We're not taking any breaks, because we'll never get people back in here. So we're just going to go for it. Um, and what we have to share, you can see by the program, we decided to present Keith in his various roles in life with the people who uh, are most relevant to those roles and uh, some music interspersed in between because we're all about music in this family. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, when Keith was admitted to hospice, uh, Peter found a book and we knew he was making some notes but we didn't know what was in it and we found it and um, he wrote some essays and um, we thought, what better thing to do than to hear from Keith himself, his views on certain things. So we are sharing those um, where appropriate at the beginning of each. And you can follow along in your program. We're not going to introduce people because everybody's introduced in the program. We're just going to take it away. So the first person who is going to read Keith's words is his brother, Rich. December 9th of last year in uh, Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. These are words from Keith. I have been up for about an hour. My brain is still reacting to the 10 radiation treatments I've had last week to combat the new brain tumor developments brought on by the esophageal cancer discovered about four years ago. This rapid increase in development urges me to document events while I still have that capability. I have really lived a great life, and I don't believe it was special to anyone else, but I want to share some stories, feelings, and other thoughts that could possibly benefit my friends and family. I can give you some painful, I can save you some painful steps where I have erred so you don't have to. We both win. Before I go forward, I need to need you to know that the brain of Keith of today thinks totally different from the brain, Keith's brain, prior to the latest radiation and steroid medications. My mathematical analysis is completely haywire. Steps that were perfectly logical to me in the past are foreign to me right now. I can make the simplest Sudoku puzzle unbelievably complicated because I no longer find the logic in what is trying to be accomplished. I do not know if I will ever regain the Keith brain of old or not, but I have determined that that doesn't matter to me. When we discovered the brain tumor three years ago, my biggest fear was losing the love portion of my brain. If I have to sacrifice the logical side to maintain my feelings toward family, love, and friends, it was a no-brainer to me. I assume that's no pun intended. <laughs> One 
what a lucky boy I am. And I think he is. I see trees of green and red roses too. I see them blue for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue. is called Knowing You Are Loved. At some point in our LaGrange household, we altered how we addressed the I love you salutation. I don't recall all the particulars, but I know Julie was in the middle of it. Instead of the normal, I love you, in the typical response of, I love you too. We said, I love you. Response, I know. I love you. Response, I know. I don't think there is a greater feeling we can give than the complete embrace of a love freely given. It does not have to be earned. It is not metered out. I think I'm the only one in this room who's known Keith every, every day of my life. I've been very blessed with a great brother. Um, we were born to very humble parents. My um, dad worked for the phone company. My mom was worked at home. And, you know, he, my dad decided to finish our house and finish three rooms in it and made us a teeter-totter and made us all a sandbox to play in. My mom sewed draperies and sewed Halloween costumes. Keith with us was a cat one year. He was a very cute cat. Um, but very typical childhood in my mind. Um, when my oldest brother was born. My dad was in the Navy, so he missed his birth. And then my mom, after he came home, had a, a little girl who only survived one day. So when Keith was born, my dad wasn't going to let anything happen on his watch. And he, my Keith had a, the umbilical cord wrapped around his neck three times, but the doctor was able to produce a very healthy birth, and my dad never left the window watching him in the nursery. 
And he was a very proud papa who, um, according to my mother, even enjoyed washing diapers. So, um, My grandmother Sorensen didn't care for the name Keith Allen. My mother said, well, we're going to probably call him Skeeter. And she said, well, I like that name, but <laughs> it didn't stick. <laughs> When Keith was three, he decided he would run away. Life must have been home at, hard at that home. Um, and my dad was, was home at the time, and he announced that Keith announced he was leaving. He had packed a, a pair of socks and a teddy bear, and he left. Um, my dad chose to just watch where he went, and he, when he got there, he just stood at, uh, got halfway down the block and stood on the corner and wasn't really quite sure what to do because he wasn't allowed to cross streets by himself. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he ended up coming home and putting his socks away. But he had the courage to try something new. And I see that in my brother. They had courage to try some unbelievably hard things in his life and do it with grace. Um, Christmas was always very special. One of the early Christmases um, involved my Aunt Virginia being solicited as a Santa Claus. <laughs> Little gender identity issues, but... <laughs> Anyway, she had been living with, with us for a year because she was going to Elmhurst College, and so um, he was, she was also his godmother. But uh, anyway, she, my dad got her the full costume, and she came in on Christmas Eve, and everyone said, Santa's here! And Keith looked at her and said, Hi, Aunt Virginia. <laughs> My parents always wanted to make it a little magical at Christmas. So every Christmas Eve, we would go to our church epiphany and um, go to the 8 o'clock service. And my dad would haul us three kids, and we'd sit in the back seat. And my dad would proceed to um, make an issue about how late my mother was and how could she be late it's going to be it's Christmas Eve and what is she doing does it take that long to put on makeup I mean he did the whole course and she was inside decorating putting all the gifts under the tree so that when we came home from Christmas it was like Santa had appeared um, that happened every year even as we were adults but I appreciated how much my parents loved us to create that magic for us, and how much I saw my brother enjoy those traditions of familyness. When I was six, I was a bluebird. And like every bluebird or Girl Scout, you always have cookies and candy you got to sell. <laughs> that year, I had chicken pox, and there was no way I could go out and get a sale. My brother, Keith, offered to sell my candy for me. And I went, really? And true to Keith's form, he never did anything without a little panache. He put on my bluebird hat <laughs> and went door to door and sold all my candy in 30 minutes. <laughs> I'm sure they felt really sorry for him. <laughs> but to me, it spoke to his loyalty and certainly something a 10-year-old boy was going to volunteer easily for, but he did. Um, our vacations were always fairly simple. We, The best thing we did is Mike cousins and aunt and uncle lived on a farm and it was our favorite thing to do is to go on the farm ride the combine ride the horse, milk the cow, sit in a circle and snap beans forever and it was all fun it was our it was just radiant 
And I know that's part of where Keith developed his love of family and extended family, because he felt the same way about all the grocers as well as the Bronewalds. It, it, it overflowed. It was just the thing that he loved. The, um, when Keith got into junior high, he, he took up wrestling. He was my babysitter a few afternoons a week because my mother took a part-time job. And, and so I was his... <laughs> well, he tried to show me some of the moves. <laughs> I, I learned what a full Nelson and a half Nelson was, and I was the victim of it. Um, one time he flipped, I don't know what the move is called, but I got flipped over his shoulder and my pants ripped to shreds. <laughs> and I said, oh, we are in trouble. <laughs> now, if you know Keith's fine motor skills, they're not real good. <laughs> and so he chose to sew my pants together <laughs> and put them promptly in the wash and, and think my mother would never notice. <laughs> She did. <laughs> but I was grateful for him wanting to help solve the problems. It really showed one of the greatest things I loved about my brother, is he could look at a situation and he could make it very simplistic. He, he'd take a complicated thing and make it simple and say, well, this is what you need to do. It's, it, there was not... It was not, um, oh boy, what are we gonna do and throw the towel out. He always could assess the situation in a very short amount of time and come out with a very solvable solution. Um, the next sport he took up was pole vaulting. <laughs> Um, he bought a 12-foot bamboo pole and practiced over our clothesline in the backyard. <laughs> Fortunately, we didn't have padding in our backyard. It was just a lawn, and the poor guy, um, it didn't last long. But, you know, it was, it was just Keith. He was tenacious. He looked for something a little off the wall, but something that he thought he could excel at. And he went full force with it. One of his, um, my son turns out to be a pole vaulter, and one of his very favorite things to do was to look at Keith's picture of himself pole vaulting. And he said, you know what, Uncle Keith, I pole vaulted too, but I had a fiberglass pole. <laughs> and I got 15 feet. <laughs> Keith never admitted how, how high he got. <laughs> but, um, being in a very uh, financially tight situation when the kids were in high school. Um, they all had summer jobs. Keith was 16 and Rich came home in the summer and was 20. And I think we still had only one car then. And he was really the last on the totem pole for the car, the car share program. And so um, one day, he came home driving a $25 car that didn't make it all the way home. <laughs> and they ended up getting pushed into the driveway. And then I guess my father helped him push it back out of the driveway and broke the headlight. <laughs> so um, that began a succession of very interesting cars, all of which had names. There was Cesar Romero Camaro, and there was Freddie Ford, and there was endless names. But I understand that he had one, I think the one after the one that got pushed out of the driveway. Um, he decided to personalize it, and he uh, painted the rims black and the lug nuts green. So he always put a little Keith flavor to things. Um, by the end of school, my brother had de developed quite a taste in dressing. Of course, he knew Susan by then, and I think he wanted to impress her. And so he would always um, save all his money and buy just some really nice clothes. And I was pretty, I was pretty impressed with my brother and how he dressed. And my other, mother, I think, was a little insulted and said, "Oh, you have to dress like the Duke of Paducah, <laughs> whatever that is." <laughs> You know, the rest of us would eye roll, but, you know, he did get to be a classier dresser, and I think a lot was due to Susan. 
Um, when he was a senior in high school, one of the memory, favorite memories was him um, performing in our Epiphany uh, live nativity. And as high schoolers, we got to play the different roles in the nativity. And usually the seniors got the primo roles. And he was Joseph. And I believe Susan was Mary. The, the secondary job was that they were on a live donkey. And we, during the church service, the person who was Joseph had to take care of the donkey and make sure it didn't make noises during the service. So. I think he put Susan on the donkey and started walking the donkey down the block <laughs> and knocking on doors <laughs> and asking if there was any room in the inn. <laughs> he didn't have too many takers. <laughs> but again, my brother spoke to what was the essence of this season. And I appreciated that. Um, my brother was a great influence in my life. If there was ever an issue that I needed, he could talk to me about it. If there was ever wise counsel, he was there to share, but only if, he, if I desired it. My dad died fairly early in our, our lives, and so it was great to have a father figure like him as well as a brother figure. He was also very generous with his boat, as many of you can attest to. And there was one time period where I had a three-year-old and a five-year-old arguing in the back seat about who had driven a boat before and who hadn't. And my three-year-old said, yes, I drove a boat. Don't you remember, Mom? Remember the man who loved me and hugged me and let me drive his boat? <laughs> he didn't remember the name. He was three. He just remembered who it was, that loving hug, that loving caress, that man who always made him feel welcome. I've been very blessed, woman to know him as my brother and know him as a friend. And I thank you for this opportunity to share these thoughts. I don't want you to forget there's pictures showing up here I know it's hard to take your eyes off the speaker, but <laughs> we got pertinent pictures. And I'm waiting for that first one. Keith Gronwald was a part of my family life for at least 55 years, since I was about 13 years old. He was three years older, a senior, when I was a freshman. He had a funky car, I remember, a Rambler with push-button start and front seats that reclined all the way back to flat, which I recall he showed me with a big knowing grin. <laughs> Though it was Susan, of course, who mostly rode around in that car, there were occasions that I would be in there being carted one place or another. One vivid memory I have, which is very appropriate for today, was fishtailing down a snowy street in Elmhurst during a winter storm. The streets in Elmhurst are narrow, and on a snow-covered snow street, you can accelerate while turning the steering wheel in such a way that the rear, rear wheel slides sideways into the curb, then turn the wheel quickly the other way so the car slides over to the other side of the street and bounces off that curb back and forth down the street. That's what we were doing. <laughs> Parents rarely condone this, which is, of course, why it was so much fun. It was one of the first memories I have of idolizing Keith like a big brother. We called him Banshee most of the time. Not even he could remember where that came from. 
He thinks it may have been when he worked construction with some guys who didn't talk English so good. But that name came on early in high school or college and stuck with us in the Epiphany Lutheran Church youth group. That youth group was our social home all through those years with choir, softball, basketball, and theater productions a part of our lives together. When Keith first entered our family because of his relationship with Susan, there was an acceptance and support from the matriarch, Delphine. <laughs> she, like Keith, and at first condoned the match. It was when things began to get serious between Keith and Susan that trouble began. <laughs> Keith had a stubborn, analytical bent, whereas Delphine was typically stubborn, emotional, and irrational. <laughs> When the two clashed, there was no ground given. <laughs> when Sue and Keith decided to get married at the tender age of 21 years, tensions were at their peak, and all of us were in the fray. There was usually no shouting in our family, just a simmering low boil of threatening consequences. <laughs> one night, I was in our kitchen trying to eat a bowl of ice cream while one of the many arguments was taking place. I think it was about Sue going unchaperoned to visit Keith at college. My mom looks over at me and says, Jeff doesn't think it's a good idea either. <laughs> I didn't look up from the ice cream, which was a very delicious vanilla. Of course, we all made it through those early troubled times, and my mom quickly grew to love Keith for all the reasons she had supported him in the first place. His humor was always his strength, and the way he could tease people without insult was brilliant. Once in her later years, Del and Keith were discussing, up, discussing an upcoming trip. She was complaining that it was too long, she had too much to do back home, and she could be dead before they got back. I'm pretty sure the trip was 10 days. <laughs> Keith says, well, Del, you could very well die while we're on this trip, but don't think we'll bring you right back. We'll just put you on ice until the trip's over. <laughs> now we'll get you back here for the funeral. <laughs> Who didn't admire Keith's ability to point out absurdity and just have fun with it? The way Bonte was able to compartmentalize his feelings, as Laurel alluded to, and emotions was never more evident than at Julie's wake. He and Susan were greeting visitors near Julie's casket, and I was standing in the back of the room in a small circle of people that included Keith's mother, Eleanor. <coughs> Suddenly, Eleanor crumpled to the floor in obvious distress. She had suffered a major stroke and was pretty much gone in that very moment. Rich and Laurel were there, Keith's brother and sister, and with others, we were able to begin making arrangements for Eleanor to be taken care of. When we went up to Keith to tell him what had happened, he thought for a moment and said, I'm in the process of saying goodbye to my daughter. My brother and sister are here to take care of mom. For me, that will have to wait for another time. It was almost a revelation to me that it was not necessary to wither into a blubbering mess of raw emotions under stress or to withdraw into stunned paralysis. I saw a strength and character that I appreciated and was remarkable. I think of all the times I offered to help Keith with various projects over the years, and either my help was respectfully declined <laughs> or I would show up at the appointed hour to find the job already close to finished. <laughs> it was only after Keith got sick that he would actually accept help with things and even request it at times. I realize now that he did not really need any help in those earlier times. He was strong and capable, so why bother someone else? Though there may have been some underlying pride, I really believe he took jobs on himself because it was more efficient and practical. When it was his focus, he just went out and got things done. I've often wondered what it was like for Keith to become part of the Grocer family. Here he was, a quiet, steady, thoughtful, independent entity, entering a world of chaotic emotions and occasional high drama. I have no doubt that many times he was highly amused, 
sometimes not even secretly. When he parented two amazingly talented kids, I think it brought him even deeper into a world of music and drama that created an incredibly diverse worldview. I know some of the boys Julie brought home would not have been the types Keith would have hung out with at that age. <laughs> Nevertheless, he was supportive of every young person who walked through his door. And here's an amazing fact about Keith Gronwald. Despite everything he went through, all the travail, the incredible hardships, the son of a gun never got gray hair. <laughs> and yes, we checked the medicine cabinets and bathroom drawers. I'm pretty sure it was legit. Finally, despite our church years together, I never knew Keith as a particularly religious person. In fact, especially after Julie's passing, I know he struggled with that part of his life. Toward the end, I think he began to try and connect with a God he felt was soon, he was soon to encounter. But this I can tell you about my big brother. If there was a need to be addressed, he was there. If there were wounds to be healed, he wanted to be the healer. If money was an issue, there was no limits to his generosity. He didn't need to profess a faith to lead a life of values. Keith was an invaluable lifelong resource to our family that can never be replaced, but only remembered and cherished. It's incredible to hear the different perspectives um, that were uh, made in, in various people's lives by a brother-in-law. And my perspective is a little bit different being the sister of um, his wife. He came into my life at about the age of 12, dating my sister and hanging around the grocer house quite a bit. Of course, um, he, he was uh, probably one of the first older men in my life besides my brothers and my dad that I saw close up and personal. And um, I actually sort of had a crush on him because he was handsome and, you know, fun and, and all that kind of stuff. It was secret and it, I never told anybody until much later. But um, as everybody else has said, he did get just absorbed into the Grocer family very quickly. And uh, as Jeff shared, you know, there's some drama surrounding their marriage. However, you know, once it was said and done, he just became such a part of our Grocer family. But again, it was my sister's husband, and so our relationship wasn't up close and personal, really until much later. And during college, my sister and I went to school together for a whole year. We went to nursing school. And so I would be studying with my sister over at their house. And I just remember Keith just kind of putting up with us, you know, being there and studying our, uh, whatever we were studying at the time, pathophysiology and those kinds of things. But he kindly endured um, sister visits, and he, he never had a problem with that. I just remember hanging out all the time at their house. After I was married to Len, we became close friends as couples and became um, spending more, started spending more time together. And uh, eventually, Keith became an employee of my husband over at a company called EPA. And it was an interesting thing because the two of them were completely opposite in their approach to everything. And so he uh, later shared with Keith later shared with me how much of a learning curve that was for him uh, as Len's employee, as Len's uh, brother-in-law too, that he would be listening to Len share his view of what needed to happen in the company. And he'd be, you know, furiously taking notes and ready to take action. And he soon, soon learned that he should not take action because Len was not done with his whole thought process. And if he took action at the beginning of that thought process, it wasn't going to be a good idea. So he had to learn. He had to wait until it was all done. And then he would figure out what to do. Keith was an internal processor. He had to have time to think about things. My husband was external, and he just talked 
about everything. So Keith shared with me later that it was quite the learning curve for him, quite the adjustment. But as Keith always did, he made the adjustment, and they had this wonderful working relationship that was, uh, was really profitable for the two of them. Um, we would spend a lot of time together as couples. We actually ended up buying boats together and spent a lot of time on the Illinois River uh, with our kids, running around, beaching it, doing cookouts, long talks on the beach over a fire at night and those kinds of things. And it was just a really special time. I can't remember exactly how long that lasted, a few years. We would just spend tons of time together as, if, as families. And that was a precious, special time in our lives. But truly, as I said, I wasn't as close to Keith uh, until a little bit later when my husband passed away in 1996. And at that time, we had already moved to Memphis, Tennessee, and so we were no longer living in the Chicago area. And uh, my husband had actually come up here to have surgery and passed away in Chicago in 1996. And Keith and Sue were the first ones to hit the hospital after the, the um, after he had passed away. And they were so kind. They opened their house to us. They had hosted our family for a whole week after my husband passed away. They hosted a myriad of people um, at their home. And it was just, as other people have related, it was just part of the generosity of, of Susan and Keith to just be there for you when you needed them most. And um, I remember a couple things from, from that week that we were in town during the funeral time of my husband's passing. One of those was um, I was having a, a hard time sleeping at the time, and so I would be awake half the night. Well, one, one night I came downstairs just wandering around the house, and I literally ran into Keith in the kitchen. And I was like, what are you doing down here? And he said, well, what are you doing down here? He was fully clothed. And I said, you know, what, what's going on? And he said, I just can't sleep. And I was going to go for a drive. And I just remember, you know, we were kind of laughing about the fact that we were um, sleepless at 3 a.m. And, uh, and so we had this really wonderful long talk that night. And then I think Susan came down not much later. And the three of us were chatting away, talking about you know, life and God and heaven and things like that that you start talking about when things like that happen. But um, another thing that happened during that week was that Keith was driving us around everywhere. And as Keith always tended to do, he was just there and supportive. And Johnny on the spot, he's going to do what he, want, what he needed to do for you at the time that you needed it. And that's how Keith was. He was just always always there for us. He became kind of a second father to my children, you know, when they lost their dad. He was always there for advice, for comfort, for, um, like somebody said, being on the boat and just hosting families uh, as much as possible because he just wanted that family around. And uh, Susan and Keith were always like that for my family, always welcoming. The other thing I remember from that week is, uh, is him driving us to the cemetery. And uh, I looked over, it was a weird time in my life, so please forgive me, but I looked over at him and I said, I don't think Len paid the taxes last year. He goes, what, what, what made you think of that? I said, I don't know. He said, well, we'll, we'll look into that after the funeral. Don't worry about it. But um, anyway, that's just how Keith was. But. Um, one of the things that made him so special to me after my husband passed away was because they worked together, he was able to fill in a lot of blanks for me. I mean, he spent a lot of time with Len. And so he's so patient to me. So many times I would say, well, what did, you know, what happened during that time? And what did Len say about that? And he was the one that was able to fill in blanks because I was just, you know, trying to raise four children and, and I wasn't as involved in the company as Keith was. So he's always gracious about that. And uh, particularly towards the end of his life, he really felt like he wanted even more to share those things with me so I would know what he knew. And that was really sweet. He was a wonderful uncle to my kids. He would, he would be at, he and Susan, of course, we'd be at graduations, birthdays. They would host birthdays, host graduations for our children. 
Um, so Keith and Susan were always a wonderful support in our lives. One funny story about, uh, we were always, in, Len and I were always in church. Church was always a big part of our lives. God was always a big part of our lives. And Susan and Keith were always, always supportive of us. But um, when my son Brian uh, was a baby, um, he was, uh, Keith was part of the uh, baptism service. And it was in the middle of summer, very hot. The church that we were in was not air conditioned. And I just remember Keith having this wool suit on for whatever reason. Maybe it was the only one he had. I don't know. But um, here he is. He's holding this baby and probably sweating very much. And um, it was a very long ceremony, by the way. But I just remember Brian just like screaming the entire time. And poor Keith, you know, maintained his dignity. But he had to hold his screaming baby for about an hour. I just ne never forget that, that, that view. Um, he, as he was diagnosed with cancer, I know that I personally felt, you know, a foundation in my li life shift just because of the role that, that Keith and Susan had already, always played. Um, we know Keith was a fighter. He never gave up. He never gave in. And his fight became ours, you know, in so many ways with prayers and just support when we could support him. Um, as, as I said, you know, church and God were an important part of my life, and uh, I would share things with Keith as I was reading them, maybe on a daily basis, you know, and he was always gracious and always willing to accept the encouragement and the prayers. There was one story in the Bible that kind of stood out, out to me as being similar to Keith's situation. There's a, a king in the Bible called Hezekiah. And his story is just really similar to, to Keith's in many ways. But this king, Hezekiah, got sick. And, um, the, and God basically told him he was going to die. And um, through a prophet, by the way. God didn't speak to him, but the prophet did. So Hezekiah, in this story, cries out to God and just prays. And God heard his prayer, and he actually gave him more time. And I just thought when I read this story that it reminded me of Keith. And, you know, we all weren't sure, of course, how things were going to turn out for Keith. But um, I, I believe that he, he was given more time. It was through prayers of people, I think, his determination, his spirit of um, just pleasantness and upbeat spirit, I think, gave him more time than uh, maybe some other people would have had with the same condition. But I, uh, I think that even though he was gone too soon, that he outlived all the predictions that people might have made about him because he, he adhered to the treatments. He had an upbeat spirit, and uh, I'm just really grateful that he had that extra time. There's a quote that Simon Simic has, and it says this. This strong bond of friendship is not always a balanced equation. Friendship is not always about giving and taking in equal shares. Instead, friendship is grounded in a feeling that you know exactly who will be there for you when you need something, no matter what or when. And I feel like Keith and Susan have always been that for me. So I thank God for this man, Keith Gronwald. He left a legacy of faithfulness, graciousness, and generosity. And for all the other reasons I've talked about, his absence will be felt forever, but his spirit will live on in all of our hearts. Thank you, Uncle Lala. Hello. Keith loved to sing. He did you could? many performances of uh, mm -hmm. chicken talk songs, I have to lean silly in. stuff. No. Oh. But uh, we used to do, love to do old classic songs together, too. So this is one I think many of you know, and we would love for you to help us along. Just in case we forget the words, maybe you can help us with it. But. It's a song I'm sure many of you remember. You got a mic there. can live by, 
yourself Because the past Is just a goodbye Teach Your children well Their father's hell Did slowly go This is a portion Keith, Uncle Keith wrote about family aunts and uncles. I have always thought that there is a special permanent love and bond that forms between nieces and nephews and aunts and uncles. This is the fabric of family values that makes families unified to deal with great and tragic situations that life delivers to us, where we can endure the tragic portions of life as a family so we do not have to endure it on our own. This special relationship is not necessarily a blood relationship, but one that once it begins, it is never going away. When I commit to the relationship, it's permanent, it's permanent so long as we both shall live. It is the child's parents who allow the relationship to occur. My initial firsthand experience with this was when my first niece, Nicole, was born to Susan's sister, Roberta, and her husband, Leonard. I felt an unbelievable special responsibility somewhere between a molder of and protector of Nicole. While not having the singular responsibility for Nicole's development, I was 100% available to give to that relationship as a backup should Roberta or Len need one. At that time, I also realized that this special responsibility was not blood related, but relationship related. It can change, but it does not go away. The real high side of my newfound responsibility as an uncle was that I was able to assure and ensure my future children's bank of aunts and uncles as a reserve supply of knowledge and wisdom when my children needed that guidance. What an unbelievable bank of resources. The rightness of these relationships revealed itself to me when my sister Laurel and her husband Eric adopted their first son, Dane. I felt just as bonded to Dane and his brother Scott who was adopted two years later, and I continued to feel those special uncle responsibilities despite there being no biological blood association. This is just how families work together as part of God's plan. Many of my children's special relationships with their aunts and uncles have proven to be a foundation to them over the years.
So I just feel incredibly um, honored to be able to represent the nieces and nephews. Um, I think I was probably chosen just because I'm the oldest. Um, so, um, but Uncle Keith and I had a really special relationship. And um, it, after I, Aunt Susan sent the um, essays kind of after she had asked me to share. And so I got to read that after the fact. But um, it's ironic, but not really, that the words he used um, when I was born, what he thought about was a, himself as a molder and a protector. And the words that I was already thinking of talking through were very similar. Um, it was mentor and steady and comforter slash caregiver. Um, and so I just thought, this is not an accident. He was very, very intentional, and he felt called as an uncle to invest in my life and the rest of his nieces and nephews. And um, he knew us well. And if you if you would ask any of us, they would say he knew me well, and he invested in me largely. And um, it was just because that's who he was. That was part of his calling and part of his purpose. And um, over the past couple years. He um, has been walking through just some personal things with me. Um, we had several meetings together, and it was such a blessing. Even though um, he was he was sick and he wasn't feeling well, he wanted to invest in me. And um, I think it's neat. Like during that time, he would um, he shared with me from the book um, "Purpose Driven Life" by Rick Warren, and it's it's a bestseller. I'm sure a lot of you have read it, but. Um, I wanted to read an excerpt that was, it was something that was important to him at this time um, that we were talking, and it and it was relatable to me because I was trying to figure out the why is like why why would this be happening and what is the purpose and all that. Um, so I wanted to read this excerpt real fast. Um, it's not about you. The purpose of your life is far greater than you will than your own personal fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It's far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you're placed on this planet, you must begin with God. You were born by his purpose and for his purpose. The search for purpose has puzzled people for thousands of years. That's because we typically begin at the wrong starting point ourselves. We ask self-centered questions like, what do I want to be? What should I do with my life? What are my goals, my ambitions, my dreams, my future? But focusing on ourselves simply doesn't reveal our life purpose. Um, in the Bible, it says it's God who directs the lives of his creatures, and everyone's life is in his power. And contrary to um, a lot of movies and seminars and books, um, you won't necessarily discover your life's meaning by looking within yourself. We've probably tried that already. Simply put, well, you didn't create yourself, so there's no way you can tell yourself what you were created for. If I have handed you an invention that you had never seen before, you wouldn't know what its purpose was. The invention itself wouldn't be able to tell you either. Only the creator, the owner's manual, can reveal its purpose. And um, he just helped me through that time, sharing some of that with me. Um, and I just, um, I'll, I'll forever remember that. Um, so back to the words, uh, the impression, the three words of impression that I had about my uncle. Um, mentor. And and this can be applied to all of his nieces and nephews. I'm sure I'm not alone in this. Um, he asked questions every time we met. So when I was a kid, I, he would always ask me, how's school? How are you doing in school? And he would give me advice about friends. As I grew up and I became a teenager and got interested in boys, he would always ask me about the boys. And he's like, you better not have any boyfriends. Oh, well, if you do have a boyfriend, he needs to come meet me. I need to prove him. Um, he was very, all of my uncles were pretty big on that. Um, and um, <laughs> he, I mean, as I grew up, like, trying to decide about school and about jobs and about a career and um, changing jobs, I mean, it was, he would always ask me about that, and Aunt Susan and Uncle Keith were always the ones that I would go to to ask for advice about that. Um, it was just a constant in my life. If I needed advice, I would ask them. Um, all right, and then he was very steady, and that's kind of been um, described a little bit, but 
you know, as my mom shared, we, we were very close. We grew up on the boat together, and it was just like he was there for every holiday, every birthday, graduations, um, just very open, warming, uh, open and warm. Um, I was even blessed to live with them for a summer, and I was just included as part of the family. I would eat family dinner with them, and I was, I was just one of them, and it was awesome. Um, and as we grew up, like, got married and I started having my own kids, he was there for my kids, too. And I can say that my kids loved him like a, like a second grandfather. Um, it was just... He was just there for them, and and that's I really think that's so rare. Like he is their great uncle, and he knew each of them, not just us, his nieces and nephews, but his great nieces and nephews. Um, and then um, to echo a little bit about what Uncle Jeff shared, and we we didn't ha know what each other was going to share, but one of the vivid memories I have about him being steady was at um, Julie's visitation in where um, Eleanor had had her stroke, and um, I was there, but then my, my memory of that happened actually after the visitation at their home at the dining room table, and it was just kind of like none of us really knew what to do. We didn't know what to say, and um, he just simply said, he was like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grieve my daughter, and then I'm going to move on, and I'm going to grieve my mother. But right now, I need to grieve my daughter. And that, to me, was just so steady and so strong. It was just a picture of who he was, very logical and very steady. But it wasn't like he was ignoring it. It was just like he knew, I, can, I can't deal with this right now. i got to go on and grieve my daughter. And I was like, okay. And it just it had a way of putting us at ease, too. Like, he's the one who, who's suffering but he was putting us at ease, and that's just what he did. Um, all right, and then he was a big comforter and a caregiver. And um, really, one of my fondest memories, um, and my mom shared a little bit, like at the time of my father's death, um, at the visitation, in fact, he, he was there just kind of watching over us hoppy kids, making sure we were okay. And um, we had a well-meaning great aunt or somebody come up to us and say, well, men, who needs them anyway? <laughs> yeah, so Uncle Keith was just kind of like, okay, and moved her along. And um, he, he just said to us, hey, listen, people don't know what to say. They're going to say really stupid things. You're just going to ignore them. And we were like, okay. And it just made us feel better. He was just a comforter. He was there. Um, and like my mom said, he was driving us around, and he was he was asking us how we were feeling and ta at, just drawing out, like, I mean, we were young. We were kids who just lost our dad, and he was just there to comfort and help us work through our feelings. We didn't know how we felt, but he was trying to help us understand how we felt. And that was... It's funny that that's one of my fondest memories of him, but I'm like, he took a comment that like could have just killed us and just made light of it and helped us feel better about it. And it wasn't about us. It wasn't that my dad was, you know, anyway. So, and I just, you know, I could talk and talk and talk about all the wonderful memories I have of him. Um, you know, I think about funerals. A lot of times at funerals, they read Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Um, and it always was like just like a sad um, passage to me. And recently I have been reading through a book that talks about um, Psalm 23 from a shepherd's perspective. And I know nothing about shepherds. I've never been around shepherds. I don't know anything about sheep. But um, <laughs> this book has taught me. It's a really good book. Um, but it just helps us, it, it helps me to understand like, why it's read at a funeral is because it's it's comforting. Like a, a shepherd is a comfort to the sheep. If they are in distress and they see the shepherd, the shepherd is there for them to protect them. And that's how the Lord is for us. And that is how the Lord used. He, he gives us people, I firmly believe, in our lives to just help care for us when we need it. And Uncle Keith was one of those. Uncle Lala was a comforter. He was a mentor. He was steady for us, and he was a comforter. And um, 
I wanted to read, I asked a bunch of the nieces and nephews to share um, their impressions of Uncle Lala. And um, each of us, oh, sorry. Okay, I just love talking to Uncle Keith about business, especially lately as my work life has been super stressful. I've called him often asking for wisdom and advice on how to deal with my boss. There were a few times when he was in Dallas for work when I lived there and he would take me out to dinner. It felt like I was like it was such a dad thing to do, a feeling that I never really got to experience except for those occasions with Uncle Keith. I so love that. Uncle Keith never complained, not only when he was sick, but just in life. I'm so encouraged and inspired by that and hope to be like him in this way. I just found comfort around him. He taught me early nights equal early mornings, peace in those mornings. Always there with very supportive career advice and suge suggestions. Once I had a really terrible idea, in retrospect, to start a thrift store design business, Uncle Keith talked so calmly with me on why this was a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> no one else could put it in such terms for me to just walk away from it, but he was so right. He embodied, he embodied strength to me and character, intelligence, and physical strength. I loved his sense of humor, knew I wanted that and a partner because of the way Uncle Keith could make me laugh. He was welcoming. The fact that seriously every time you saw him, he made sure and asked you specifically what was going on in your life and how it was, and if you needed advice on it, he always gave it with sincerity. He will always be the captain of any boat I ride on. One of the coolest things about Uncle Law was that he took the time to understand each of his family members on an individual and personal level. You can tell how he engages with people that he was a true, that he has a true interest in hearing about the things that are most important to them. He was the definition of generosity to me. Open heart, open home. I loved when we would visit. He would go. We would go to the. He would go to the grocery store early in the morning to buy cereal, and he would come back with eleven boxes, <laughs> covering every base and genre of cereal anyone would want. Same with ice cream. Why buy one when you can buy seven? When my dad died, he was the one who made us start talking about our feelings. At the time, I had no idea what I felt, but he started, but he talked about losing his own father and how he, he felt, and it helped simply hearing him do that. He was the best storyteller. No one told family stories so well. His humor was top notch and could leave anyone and everyone in stitches. His advice was always logical and practical. He was such a good listener. He was confident in his ideas, but open to talking about yours. I will take this wisdom with me through my life. And just a few additions um, for our family. When we would go to the boat, um, his great nieces and nephews, he started a tradition of baths outside in a little kiddie pool. And um, it was so sweet because when we were, at, when we were growing up at the boat, we would this is kind of gross, but we would just take baths in the lake. Like we would get the soap and the sh and shampoo, and that's what we did. So he, he wanted to continue that with his um, great nieces and nephews. Um, so he, he was Uncle Lala, and uh, CJ started that one, but we, we carried that on. He had lots of good nicknames. is Aunts and Uncles Continued by Keith. Most of the non-official aunts and uncles were established and so designated by the parents of the children in a loving manner early on. Uncle Paul and Aunt Joanna Hedinga are some of the best friends of Keith and Susan. Joanna was the piano teacher for Julie and Peter. Paul and Joanna's youngest son, Joe, was a best friend of Julie's throughout public schools in LaGrange. When Julie died, Uncle Paul and Aunt Joanna took on the role of Keith and Susan's grief counselors as one of our most effective mechanisms to cope with the tragedy. Similarly, similarly Uncle Randy and Aunt Margie Truckenbrot and their children, myself, Julie's best friend, and Carrie and Cindy embraced this situation by delivering support as needed as we waded through the grief process and reinvented ourselves. Thank you. 
went to sleep. <laughs> oh, boy. <clears throat> See if I can get through this. I got some laryngitis. Uh, I can't believe how everybody has said what I was going to say. Um, but I'm going to do it anyway. You're going to, it's confirmation from the outside, um, outside the family. Um, <clears throat> and there are a number of people in the room who knew Keith as long as I did, but most of them are family. Uh, when I think of the 55 years that I've known Keith and Susan, friends and family were interchangeable. Their families were their friends and their friends were treated like family. There were many times through their years when our friendship intersected with family functions. Many times um, we were always invited to participate in their family functions. Many times I thought I knew the grocer and grown wall extended families, aunts, uncles, siblings, nephews, nieces, and even their cousins better than my own. Uh, our daughters only knew Keith as Uncle Keith. For me, it would be difficult to imagine my life journey without Keith and Sue. I can remember always being impressed with Keith and Sue from the day I met them as I was a freshman in high school. Both had leadership qualities that I admired from the start. Of course, they were older, so I guess that was a natural feeling for a frosh. Uh, what I remember most is that they were a lot of fun to be around and that I didn't want it to end with high school. I made sure to not to lose touch with either of them during our college years. Uh, fast forward a few years to their wedding. Keith marrying the girl of his dreams, a girl everyone admired. At that wedding, a kid from Epiphany Lutheran Church, half blinded by an eye patch, leaps high above the crowd with his two inch vertical jump to snag the garter, <laughs> securing a permanent place in their wedding book. <laughs> this is an important life experience, I want you to know. Uh, like a lot of you might agree, the rest can be a blur. So many great times, but also sad times shared. The grace with which Sue and Keith endured family tragedies was amazing to me. Uh, from their brother-in-law, Lynn Hoppe's unfortunate passing at an early age, to Julie's celebration and Del Grosser's funeral, there was a very conscious effort to celebrate life at a family member's passing. Uh, each one like this one will be unforgettable. I don't think... If, how many people have had an experience like this or some of the prior ones? Uh, it's amazing to me how they've been able to do this. Uh, there are qualities about Keith that were endearing uh, to me because they reminded me of the qualities I, that I grew up with from my father. They were very similar in temperament as well as always up for a laugh. Often both were the source of people laughing. Uh, they were honest people, always exhibiting integrity, easily gaining trust of people around them. A first-class father, remembering, uh, I remember hearing about Keith being the host of many pancake breakfasts on Saturday mornings with Julie and Pete. He cherished his children and the role of dad. His work-life balance was 20 years ahead of his peers. He was a great listener. I mean, you've, you hear this over and over again. Uh, he was always respectful of others' opinions, and uh, he never stepped on anybody's conversations. He let them talk. Uh, he was thoughtful in his responses, rarely argumentative about his differences of opinions. He was always looking for logic and conflict resolution. I think he enjoyed helping people in this area. I think people not enjoying each other bothered Keith. In a very nice way, he always wanted to express an opinion on how to resolve the conflict. He was always a peacemaker. Um, he was always a gentleman as well. Uh, in all these many years, I never witnessed him being angry. I'm sure he was at times, but I never admit, uh, remember that about him. Um, th there were obvious reasons for both of us to remain best friends throughout our lives. Um, I think Keith had a lot of best friends. I think everybody kind of viewed Keith as a best friend and likewise from him. Uh, I will miss Keith for his tremendous sense of humor. Again, it's been said over and over again. And his delivery of humor. He was not a center stage guy. He was always hanging out in the wings and his delivery was immensely uh, uh, funny, to me anyway. 
Uh, life won't be the same or nearly as much fun without Banshee. I thought I'd be the first to say that. Of course, Banshee, you came up already. Uh, and, you know, we, none of us compared speeches. So, you know, when I keep, I'm hearing these things, I'm going, well, I guess I got them right. So, uh, <laughs> anyone that referred to Keith as Banshee was a 50 year friend from Epiphany Lutheran Church. You couldn't say or hear that without a smile coming to his or your face. He called me Ranch Boy, mimicking my mother's nickname for me. The funny part of this was that it had to be said in Western style. Margie and Keith had it down pat. Ranch Boy? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that was always hilarious to hear. Uh, I always saw Keith as a fantastic sales personality, uh, yet he once told me that he was not passionate about sales, uh, but he liked all other aspects of business. Uh, he liked everyone, but was especially fond of people and operations of companies he worked for or consulted. During our final trip uh, together, he reflected on people and operations that he enjoyed. Um, for anybody that's here that are in the operational side of those businesses, take that to heart because he loved all of you. As the conversation evolved, and this was in Barbados, he brought up by Peter and how proud he was of his ability to take on remodeling projects and complete those projects. I think several of those projects involved Keith and Pete working alongside each other. He thoroughly enjoyed that interaction. One project that they worked on together that did not involve remodeling was stringing lights at the site of Pete and Icy's wedding reception. They were debating whether they should get a lift or not, because uh, it might be too expensive. Um, Keith heard Pete tell someone that his dad would figure it out because he could do anything. Um, in his final days, they had comments by Pete. <clears throat> it was printed in his memory. Um, this is not laryngitis. <clears throat> I spoke with Pete during Keith's journey to the, into hospice. He had no idea <clears throat> that his dad heard that proclamation and that it had such a great impact on him. <clears throat> we couldn't talk for 20 seconds. <clears throat> Some may, may know, while others may not, that Mark and I had special privilege of spending several days um, <clears throat> with Keith and Sue in Barbados just prior to Keith's decision to go into hospice care. <clears throat> Keith wanted to go out of the country one last time in search of warmth. Uh, chemo and radiation had made it difficult for Keith to feel warm. Keith had a monumental task, effort, in staying alive over the last four and a half years. And at a time, it appeared to be winning the battle because he kept much of his discomfort to himself. What a great attitude he had. Much of this trip, he was managing pain, which was very difficult, yet each day he would put his game face on and try to have some fun. On Monday of that trip, he seemed to find balance in pain medication. We saw the Keith most of us uh, are familiar with one last day. He indicated that the last brain therapy treatment had robbed him of his ability to complete Sudoku muscle puzzles and even figure tips. The next evening at dinner at Yugo's, Keith stated if anyone wanted to go home the next day, he would be okay with that. Uh, it wasn't stated as a complaint or a demand. It was his nice of saying he had to go home. Later that evening, he asked if, he, if we needed help in calculating the tip. So <laughs> he was still looking for people to laugh, even though he was ready to go home. By this time of the trip, and I suspect for quite a while before the trip, Keith had been catnapping through the day and night without extended periods of sleep. Extended periods of comfort um, was long gone for Keith. It became obvious how difficult this pattern had become for not only Keith, but for Susan and Pete and Heisey to experience the decline. Wednesday was a sad day for all of us as we knew we would never see Keith again alive. When we came out of our room that morning, the decision hadn't been finalized. Sue was packed 
and flight changed from Saturday to Wednesday. Who, who could know that would be the day they would ground the 737s? They were already at the airport. Uh, American Air Airlines could see how uh, bad shape that Keith was in and hastily transferred them to a flight to Charlotte. With flight delays and transfers through customs, the travel time was over 13 hours. We could not have imagined that trip home as Keith could not maintain comfort for 15 to 20 minutes without moving. When Margie and I were at the airport on Saturday, Keith called us to tell us he had decided to stop further treatment and to go into hospice. That final trip home had uh, stripped him of all his desire, I think, to go on. I want everybody to know that Keith had no regrets. <clears throat> at the beginning of the, of the journey of cancer, doctors told Keith he had 20% chance of making a year, and he expressed the desire to live three years. He was never given a chance of living four and a half years, and he made the absolute best of the time he had left. Having that much time to adjust to the pending loss was a real gift to his family and his friends. Thank you, Banchi, for the memories. I think I should just say ditto. <laughs> wow, everything is, uh, it's, ex you know, just the same all the way through. So, um, so how do you begin to capture in a few words the impact of a friend like Keith? A person who changed the course of my life and my fam family's life, helping me to be the best person I could be, both in business and personally. I wrote much of this while sitting on a beach looking at the water. How fitting that seems that that's where I would be when writing a few words in memory of my good friend Keith. He loved the water and boating and sharing all of that with all his family and friends. You've heard a lot about that, probably many of you. He loved creating the spaces and the places where people who he loved could be together, laughing and eating, working, and simply enjoying life. Maybe in some way he's here with us today. I believe he is. As I said, Uncle Keith, as I often called him, and many of you did as well, was truly <clears throat> the best friend and adopted uncle a person could have. I wrote down a few key words, like others have done, that come to mind about Keith. Um, they just made sense to me. Wingman. He was surely the best wingman ever to be. Always at your side, never getting in front of you, supporting you, but also honest. Always nicely honest, but nonetheless honest, right? He would tell you the truth, but in loving and supportive ways. For me, I always felt that he was in my court. He certainly was available, showing up at all of our family events, concerts, graduations of our kids, you name it. He was there, and you all have had the same experience. Couldn't think of another word, but servant leader uh, is what came to mind as I thought about Keith and my business and in my personal life and in the lives, really, of many of you. But Keith exemplified this for me, both in our friendship and in working together. Keith was able to <clears throat> lead from behind, encouraging me to be the best I could be. That's the definition of a true servant leader. Of course, he could have been first always, no doubt of that. But he just seemed to thrive in being supportive of others, helping them to succeed in all kinds of ways. He had a way of not getting lost in complexity. So his favorite word to me was, what's next? Working together, I would often walk in with my grand vision from some project when we were working together when he was the general manager in my company. He would quietly sit not say much until the next day when he would come in and say something like, you know, I was thinking overnight about your idea, and if we we're going to do that, wonder what's next. And it was just his simple step-by-step -step approach uh, taught me to do this in so many areas of my life. What's next? Thank you, Keith. I guess my personal favorite is 
Drinky drinks? <laughs> Come on, you've all had that. Uh, is it time for some drinky drinks? And of course, who served them up but Keith? As I said before, he loved just creating that space and that place where people he loved could be together, enjoying each other, some good food, lots of laughter and stories that were often told over and over again. One such story we laughed about many times was when we had, uh, when he had prepaid for Peter's summer piano lessons with Mrs. Music. <laughs> but because the lessons never happened, Mrs. Music sent Keith a refund check. I can still remember Keith laughing with tears in his eyes as he not only gave her the refund check back, but also reminded her that she had never deposited his original check in the first place. <laughs> Keith just had a way of loving you and at the same time telling stories on you uh, in ways that you could both laugh together over. Celebrations. Um, let's see, am I? This, uh, okay, excuse me. He loved to celebrate all the small and often large things, but with a little twist to those celebrations. For example, when I was about to retire, Keith decided to throw, not a retirement party, of course, that little twist you were talking about, but a graduation party. <laughs> My graduation party put on for me, it was complete with a gra graduation cap and gown, a king's ride on the Rainer chariot, otherwise called a forklift, <laughs> and a proclamation of my graduation retirement. Uh, he just had a way of always putting that twist on it and uh, enjoying life. I was able to spend a few last hours with Keith. He was unable to respond for the most part. And that gave me a time to simply be in his presence as he was in the process of leaving this earth. As I told Peter, we talked about it at length. As I told Peter, it was a feeling really of great peace, saying a few words to thank him for being such a good mentor, such a great friend and confidant in my life. And even though there was a profound sadness in losing him and in seeing his diseased body slowly drift away, there was and still is a comforting presence of his heart in mine, and I think in some way mine in his. My favorite author, Frederick Buechner says it best. When you remember me, it means you have carried something of who I am with you, and that I have left some mark of who I am on who you are. It means that you can summon me back to your mind, even though countless years and miles, and now death itself, may stand between us. It means that if we meet again, you will know me. It means that even after I die, you can still see my face and hear my voice and speak to me in your heart. Keith, we will forever carry you. I will, Joanna will, Andy, Joe, all of our family. We will carry you in our heart, and hopefully one day we will meet again. Sowing seed, and 
Yeah, we give up our sunshine So we can buy what we need That leaves the evening To share a fire with a friend or two To lose sight of the hours To go lightly with you favorite things in life is listening to Peter sing. Mm -hmm. This is about Emmett Quinn. It's called Showing Up. My first job in business was being the order department manager for Daubert Chemical Company. Did I say that right? I'm from Louisiana. It should, or should be Daubert. Anyway. <laughs> Our offices were in Oak Brook, Illinois, with six plants around the U.S. My job was to initiate production orders for adhesive chemicals for the auto industry. 99% of my time was spent in Oak Brook, but when we took inventory, I would go to Chicago plant and assist with the count. It was during an inventory that I got to know Emmett Quinn. Emmett had worked for the company for about six years and was the foreman for his department. A coworker of mine relayed the story of how Emmett got his job. 
In the early 1960s, the company put a sign in front of the plant that it would be hiring two people the next morning. The line formed early and over 200 people showed up for the two positions. The company offered the jobs to two people at the beginning of the line and told everyone else to go home. The two new hires were told to be there the next morning at 8 a.m. The next morning, the two new hires were there to begin their first day of work. Emmett Quinn also showed up and began to work alongside the two new hires. The foreman of the department told Emmett that he did not have a job and would not be hired or paid for his work. Emmett told the foreman that he did not have anything else to do, so he might as well keep on working. This continued on for the rest of the week. Sometime during the second week of Emmett's volunteer working, one of the two people originally hired quit their job. At that point, the foreman put Emmett on the payroll. He was given the job because he was already doing the job. Emmett bypassed all the people competing for the job by ignoring the odds and risking giving a few days of work to showcase his talent and work ethic. He showed up and he was ready to play. Susan, thanks so much for the honor of being able to do this. I appreciate it. And hello, friends. Um, I don't know many of you, and there's a pretty good chance that many of you don't know a lot of the other people here. But today, when we're all sitting here sharing in the love of, of Keith and, and loving on and supporting the Groenwald family, I call us all real close friends today, right? All right, good. Uh, well, Susan had contacted me and asked me to speak on Keith as an employee. And, and I got to be honest with you, I kind of cringed. At, at that, because he was so much more than, than that word uh, conjures up in your thoughts. Um, he was to us, uh, uh, to both myself and all the people within Essential Products, um, he was our mentor. Uh, he was a comforter. Uh, he was our guide. All, all words that, I mean, you've, you've heard these words so many times already. Here's one you haven't. He was our Obi-Wan. This is the kind of guy that he was. So I tried thinking about, you know, putting together some words and, and, and to, to give you the idea of, of what this guy meant to us. And, and I kept coming back to a, an email I was able to send to him the day after he made the decision to go into hospice. I sent it to him on, on 317. And uh, I, I can't think of a better way of, of putting it than to just uh, take the easy way out and just reading that email to you. Uh, but before I do, I've got uh, three little anecdotes to tell you about uh, with Keith uh, to give you a little better concept and, and, and context with, with what this uh, uh, email is about. And the first one has to do with business consultants. The second one has to do with Honeycrisp apples. And the third one has to do with a Jesus cartoon that he had on the credenza behind his desk. Good grouping, huh? <laughs> well, with the business consultants, um, my experience with business consultants way back when was not real good. Uh, we had, uh, I worked for a company where they brought in a business consultant and hey, they're gonna come in here, take a look at the way how we're running this company and, and we're gonna improve on this place and it's gonna be great. But in actuality, it was the complete opposite. So fast forward to when I'm working with Paul at, at uh, Rainer Dye Supply, Paul introduces Keith to me as, hey Dave, meet my best friend Keith and He's a business consultant, and he's going to make this company work a whole lot better. <laughs> Great! So that's the business consultant one. Uh, Honeycrisp apples. I'm not sure exactly when this began, but on his trips back from the lake house in Michigan, he would bring with him a whole bunch of these Honeycrisp apples. And it was about 2.30 in the afternoon, 
in the kitchen of the office, and it's a small office, but in the kitchen of the office, he would cut up these Honeycrisp apples. And the knives we had there were very dull. <laughs> and, and the plates were these, these kind of cheap uh, china plates. And so when the, app, when the knife cut through the apple, it really didn't cut through, it snapped through. And when it snapped through, you'd hear this loud tink every time it would hit the plate. And he would cut up these apples into bite-sized pieces, and he would come around and, into all of our offices and off, no, he wouldn't offer. He demanded we took a couple of pieces of apples from him, something about um, eating healthy or something. Uh, but as time went on, he actually turned us into his own personal Pavlov's dogs. <laughs> At 2.30, all of us would be sitting around, where's the tink? Where's the tink? And then he would do it and come around and, and hand us our, our apple pieces. Um, the third story, the Jesus comic, and I know you're all waiting to hear this one. OK, on uh, the credenza behind his desk, uh, there was a greeting card, and it was kind of like in the uh, in the the vein of a, like a Far Side cartoon, if you know what I mean. And, and one of you may have sent the card to him. I'm not sure, uh, but it was a, it was a caricature of of Jesus, and above his head in bold letters and an exclamation mark, it said, "He's coming," and down below in bold letters, it said, "Act busy." <laughs> I still crack up when I, when I think of that. All right, so with that said, here's the email I sent to him on the 17th, the day after he made the decision to go into to hospice. Hey, Rockstar. Oh, wait a minute. <clears throat> okay, I'm good. All right. Hey, Rockstar. Thank you so much for the honor of your call yesterday, letting me know of your decision. You just continue to amaze me with your strength, courage, grace that you have exuded in your entire life. I know that in this little circle of friends, the, the Essential Products family, we all look up to you and so appreciate your love and concern for us. We have nothing but love for you and we thank you for all you have done for us. Without your guidance, I am sure that Rain or Die Supply and Essential Products would be nowhere close to what it has become today. You have made an impact on every one of ours and every one of our family's lives. For me, you went from, uh-oh, a business consultant, to, hey, maybe this will be a good thing, all the way up to, don't make a final decision without running it by Keith first. To where it is today, no major decisions are made without first asking ourselves, WWKD. <laughs> I can't say enough for how much I have loved having you care about this company and everyone in it, and selfishly, how much love you have shown me. Thank you, buddy. I have nothing but love and respect for you, too. Not only have you shown me how to own a company, but you have shown me how to live a life with meaning, dignity, and along with a splash of humor. Every now and then, we are blessed to know someone on a personal level where we see attributes that we want to have as part of ourselves. In the friendship we have, I have witnessed in you and tried hard to add some of you into my DNA with the hope that one day I'll be able to pass them on and pay it forward to the ones I know. That, my friend, is proof of a life well lived and a race well run. I know that God loves you and loves what you have done with this life that you have been given. Heck, you even made your decision on 316. I'm a better man for knowing you, and I look forward to talking with you again soon. With lots of love, respect to you, Susan, and your entire family. Thank you. Susan, thank you. Pete, thank you. This is quite an honor to be here today. 30 years ago, almost exactly this spring, uh, Leonard Hoppe handed Keith a resume from a kid he met at a gas station. I'm guessing Keith kind of rolled his eyes at the time. 
but he ended up hiring me at Exchange Parts of America. Now, shortly thereafter, he moved me to Arkadelphia, Arkansas. <laughs> that went well. That went well. Um, he called it a promotion, so I bought into it. Um, I first uh, realized how much I respected Keith and, and what a leader he was when, when early on at Exchange Parts, I, I had a project I was responsible for and it didn't go well. Um, the, the client was unhappy. I was convinced it wasn't my fault, but a couple of the management team wouldn't listen to that. So I was pretty down, I was pretty depressed. Um, and, and you know, it was my first job right out of school. I thought I was gonna conquer the world. And uh, Keith didn't talk about it, didn't have a long conversation. He just asked a question. He said, so are you done? Have you given up? Because if that's the case, just, just let us know. And I realized how wise he was and he knew exactly the right question to ask and the button to push to get me back in the game. And that began uh, 30 years of, of, of respect and uh, really a mentorship that I've enjoyed with Keith. Um, really of the Three most important men in my life were my father, my high school football coach, and, uh, and Keith for what he taught me about professionalism and many other things in business. At Exchange Parts, we went through a lot. It was only three years that I worked there, but the company, you know, I moved to Arkansas. Keith was the first person I ever negotiated with. I think he thought that was pretty humorous <laughs> when he had to negotiate with a 22-year-old for his contract to move to Arkansas. Um, but he paid for my move, so that was good. <laughs> taught me a lot there. Um, he taught me a lot about um, business. We went through very tough times. The company went through a bankruptcy, and he taught us how to treat the vendors right so that we didn't burn them. Taught us how to treat the customers right. And most importantly, he taught me and taught all of us how to treat our employees right. Um, to manage with respect, to manage with um, care, but at the same time hold people accountable. And that's, that's a tough, tough thing to do, to balance the two. But Keith did it well. Um, he was always that, that uh, uh, calm within the storm. I, don't, I never saw Keith upset um, about anything. He always handled it well and, and gave us that um, uh, example in the organization. So I worked for him for three years there, and then um, I, think he, I think Sue and Keith felt guilty, and so they hired me to come to Chicago and work at Barter Corp to get me out of Arkadelphia, Arkansas. Um, and so I spent nine years there, and, and most of that time I worked for Susan, uh, but Keith was always present, and um, he, that's when he really became more of a coach and a mentor. Um, I would go visit him next door and uh, talk to him about things that were happening at work and ask for his advice. And, and he just was always a, a, a reliable source of wisdom and guidance. Um, kind of a funny little wisdom story, and, and, and it sounds a little petty maybe, but he had a coffee cup in his office at uh, Exchange Parts at the Brakeshaw Company. And it's always stood in my mind. It said, failure to plan on your part does not constitute an emergency on my part. <laughs> and although Keith was always one that would help and support you, he never really let you die on the vine like that, that type of thinking was what he taught us. And that's the type of thinking that, that he had, was to plan ahead, don't, don't leave it to the end. And um, it, was always, it was always really valuable thinking. Um, after Barter Corp, we really moved into kind of a third phase of our relationship. Uh, as I started my business, um, Keith and I would go to grab lunch every so often. We'd go to Portillo's, um, always Portillo's. I think that was Keith's choice, Keith's choice. And um, that was really valuable to me, really important to me. Shortly after I started my business, my, my, my father passed away. And um, I never shared this with Keith, but I was probably too embarrassed. But in many ways, he filled that void for me. Um, when we talk about the company growing and changing. 
he would always ask about the business, and he was always proud of what we were doing. And so it was really, it really filled that space for me to have that person in my life that could look at it that way. I think the, uh, it came full circle. One of my favorite, uh, kind of the best story from when we used to go to lunch, um, maybe four years ago, we were sitting there and I shared a story about a new employee I just hired, really sharp, intelligent young man right out of school, full of all kinds of potential. And I was telling Keith I thought he was gonna be a key part of my team. I said, but you know this kid, he thinks he knows everything. He doesn't, he doesn't ever question anything. He's always right. And Keith did what you did. He just kind of sat back and smiled and took me a couple seconds and I went, oh yeah. <laughs> so how'd you deal with that? <laughs> I started this um, uh, conversation talking about Keith's question of whether I was gonna give up. And for 30 years, I've remembered that and thought that was about me, that Keith knew that was the right button to push in me. And I'm sure he did, but I realized as I prepared these notes and thinking about the last five years, that's really about Keith. He never gave up, and he showed us that in the last five years of how he lived with grace and peace and really continued to be an inspiration for, for all of us. And he's with me today, and I know he's with all of you today, and he always will be and he'll always be an inspiration. Thank you. This song's called uh, Young at Heart. And Peter and I have had the privilege to play this on tour many times over the last 10 or 12 years. Some of my favorite memories do include stopping at their house in LaGrange on tour with the band playing some pool, having a, trying a Sierra Nevada for the first time. And also going to a sushi restaurant in Seattle and uh, before a show. Peter has always been an amazing wingman who has the talent to be the front man, as we've all seen tonight. And there's so many characteristics that are similar, I'm noticing, listening to stories about Keith. And, and it, interesting, too, I saw Brian Hoppy in the lobby consoling Goldie, and that reminded me of the story that Roberta was telling about Keith consoling Brian. As you are, it's 
much better by far to be young and high. And if you should survive to a hundred and five, think of all you'll derive. I get to, ooh, that was beautiful. I get to read about Amelia, if I can. Ooh, sorry. Thank you, Aunt Sue. <laughs> Amelia, the life extender. There's no doubt in my mind that Amelia extended my life by sharing her joy. If I had to guess how long, I would estimate an added two years. I'm concerned with spending time with her, not because of things I'm able to teach her, but for those things that she has taught me. When Amelia was two, we adopted Bobby and Amelia's Day of Fun. <clears throat> It starts with Boppy and Amelia making a list of what we want to do. Amelia names the what, and Boppy writes them down. Sometimes Grandma comes too. Early on, on one of those days, Amelia wanted to go to the park. The park she wanted to go to was bordered by a creek on two sides. We walked down to the creek at her request. The water was only about nine inches deep and she continued stepping from exposed stone to exposed stone. Although she was never sure-footed, the only peril she faced was falling into nine inches of water, so I let her explore. She noticed the moving water and the small fish and twigs and leaves floating. After about 15 minutes, I asked her if she was ready to go. She said, no. So I said we could stay a little longer. After another 10 minutes, we repeated the above, and again, two more times. Finally, when I, asked, sorry, when I asked her one more time, she said no. And I asked her, how much longer would you like to stay here? And she said, Bobby, I never want to leave. We did finally leave and have never been able to exactly duplicate that life experience in the way we did that day, but we both still remember it. It did not cost a dime and still remains a cherished experience. There's 
There's a girl who I once knew She looks so very much like you The resemblance is deceiving as can be She's been a teacher, been a learner Been a writer, been a reader Changed by different paths along the way I want a lover till this world's through So we can walk along in the summer sun Lie by the fire to the wind Hello. Hello. Um, that song was for right after I speak these words. So I figured I'd just cut it off so it made the most sense. Um, but it did give me a nice break to collect myself. Um, thank you all for joining us on this balmy <laughs> spring day. Ah, oh, boy. Um, I wrote a lot of this down, and I'm just going to kind of speak free stories in the middle of it. Um, but I'll just begin. Um, I didn't want to write this. I guess nobody wants to write these things, but I had a really hard time sitting down to start typing. I've been thinking about what I would say here for almost five years. In a way, I was kind of excited. I knew today was coming eventually, and I was excited to have the chance to memorialize him perfectly. As this day got closer, I found out that I was not excited at all. I'm a songwriter, and I write about a variety of subjects and emotions. I write about 100 songs a year, and a lot of them are about love and loss and other things, but hardly any are really about my loves or my loss. It's not that they haven't, not that I haven't started those songs. <clears throat> I've got half-written songs about Julie, about my wife, and both of my daughters. I just can't finish them due to a fear that they won't be as precious as my people are to me. But I couldn't really get out of finishing this one, so here it goes. Not a song. It's impossible to pick the best stories shared with and lessons learned from my dad. As we all know, he was an incredible storyteller, but I happen to be on the very fortunate side of some stories that he made. While preparing to write this, I was relieved to realize that I didn't have to share all the stories today, not even all the best ones. I'll highlight a few memories, and I look forward to sharing many more with you all for the rest of my life. Um, I'll just leave that there. Um, when I was a kid, my dad coached pretty much all of my baseball teams. And he, he had a, such a reputation of fairness that some kids got a little, little miffed about because he made sure that everybody had equal playing time instead of having the best kids playing the best, their best position. Um, he led, uh, I forget what year, but he led one of our teams to the championship game, which was nobody thought was going to happen. Uh, nobody else in our league, n nobody on the team. <laughs> For real. Um, but he, he had a vote within the team. Do we continue letting everybody keep equal playing time or do we start the best players first for the championship game? The team made a vote following his example and voted for equal playing time. We lost that game. <laughs> but, um, but everybody was so excited to be a part of that 
the team and that group of people. And um, as I will note later, I've gotten messages over the past few weeks of players from that team saying how much of an impact he had on them as a kid and people that I haven't talked to for 20 years. Um, he made me run more laps than any other player. <laughs> if I talk back even just for an instant, which I was used to because he's my dad, around the field, nobody else had to run laps, but he wanted to make sure nobody else thought I was getting the easy road because I was his son. Um, earlier on in baseball, my dad had a nickname for me that was Wiener Boy. <laughs> Still not sure in any era if that would be a correct <laughs> name to have for a person. But maybe to my, uh, to my pushing, he shortened it to Weeb, which was still not great. But there was one time warming up, he was proud of my long arm, so we, we started playing catch short and we would spread out you know, to where we were, I don't know, 50 yards away. And there was one time that I was paying attention to something else, which often happens, and um, I just heard, hey, wiener boy, <laughs> in front of all my friends. <laughs> and that is a lasting uh, sore spot that I have. Oh, boy, Keith. Um, the next thing, the next kind of subject I have is the way he fostered my music. Um, my parents both were my biggest fans. They traveled around the country whenever they could to see wherever I, wherever I was on tour. Um, but that started when I was young and my dad took me to the guitar center on Roosevelt Road. I think every Wednesday after youth group we would go and he would let me play anything that I wanted to play and just sit there for a couple hours while I just went through and um, that hit me yesterday and I was thinking, I don't think I would do that. Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> if you've ever been into a guitar center, it's not the ple there, everybody's playing different things at the same time, but he just, he, he knew that I loved it and he just sat there and let me do my thing. Um, he, I told him I, I wanted to start playing drums and which I'm sure to the rest of the family was like, oh, damn, really drums? <laughs> but he said, I'll buy you, he always made deals, fair deals, but he made a deal with me. If you buy, I will buy you a snare drum and you will take lessons. And if you excel at those lessons, we can buy a drum kit, possibly. I did excel at those lessons. He did buy me a drum kit. Um, but he always had a way to structure a deal that was mostly fair to me, but that he, he just wanted to keep things. He wasn't going to give it away for free. Um, the last one, <laughs> this is funny. Um, I wanted to get my ear pierced when I was 15. And he was like, ah. He was probably already worried about it, but he said, if you if you learn and record 10 songs, I will take you to get your ear pierced. I learned and recorded 10 songs, and he took me promptly to Claire's Boutique in the Yorktown Mall, and I can still fit one in there. Um, as I got a bit older, he was well known to both Julie and I for sending his care packages. I believe when Julie was on the ships, on the cruise ships entertaining, he would send packages of cookies and just a whole bunch of other things. And he, at camps throughout our, our whole childhoods, he would send us notes and from the whole family just to make sure that we were, we felt loved and we were still on their minds. Um, one of my favorites was I did a, month-long trip in Alaska and we were instructed when we got there that to use the bathroom you would have to wipe with leaves or rocks or whatever you can find there was no toilet paper because you had to do it in the ground and 
Um, but my dad sent me a very nice care package with rolls of toilet paper that he had taken out the cardboard, so unwound the whole things, and then wound them back up to where they were just this big, so I could be comfortable in, in my times of need. And, and after that, he kept sending care packages full of honey, bunch of his, uh, honey bunches of oats, mac and cheese, and you know the regular things that keep you going in your late teens, early 20s. Um, chronologically next, my bachelor party. Um, we did this at my parents' lake house in New Buffalo. We, I invited my dad and he said he did not want to impose. He did not want to come. He would not come. At some point we're going to have to get back to the fishing picture, but I'll, we'll keep riding. Um, he did not want to impose on our, on the group of five guys that I had out there. We took a boat ride on their bigger boat. Um, when we went to come back, or when we tried to start the boat to come back in, the boat would not start. So I called my dad, as I normally would in any situation like that. Um, and he said, well, you could get a tow boat, but that'd be a couple hundred bucks. I'm an hour and a half away. I'll be there. And I was like, what? Don't do that. But he's like, no, no, no I'll just be there. Just wait. I was like, yeah, but we don't have an anchor. So anyway, <laughs> around two hours later, um, we drifted about a mile into the middle of Lake Michigan, if not for a well-packed cooler by my uh, groomsmen, we would have been getting a little, uh, little testy. And then I had realized that we were on their big boat, and the small boat that he would be towing us in on was called POC, which a lot of you guys know. That's an acronym for piece of crap. <laughs> I was like, dang, how is this all going to really end up? Um, just as it started to get chilly, my dad appeared on the horizon as if coming out of the sun, <laughs> blazing, hauling ass, coming close to us. Um, just, and we immediately started chanting, Keith, 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 Keith. <laughs> The entire ride back, which could have been half an hour, it could have been two and a half hours, I have no idea, because we were still just, Keith, Keith. Um, but we all got to see, it made me proud to show my friends another kind of superhero display of my dad. Um, we got back, we all made him stay for dinner, and my best man was part of my bachelor party. Um, the last kind of memory that I'm going to share is my wedding ring, which is my dad's. Um, when I, <laughs> I was recounting the story last night, but I asked my mom, I was prepared to uh, propose to my wife, and I didn't have, I probably had $50 in my bank account. Um, so I was like, Mom, do you have any, you know, heirloom... <laughs> you don't need like diamonds laying around anywhere. <laughs> if you got something, that would be great. Because I want to lock this girl up, but I got no money. Um, and she said, I've got my wedding band that I, that I haven't worn for years that didn't fit anymore. And you're welcome to have that. And I said, well, that would be perfect. I would love to make one like my dad's to replicate that. Um, after we made that decision, my dad came to me and said, Pete, you should just take mine. You're sentimental. I'm not. <laughs> I was like, okay, like you care about these things. <laughs> and it's not that he didn't care about anything, but it just the way the uh, the way that he freely gave me something that he'd been wearing for 40 years, 42 years, 
I'll get another one, I don't care. Um, because he knew it means so much to me, which it does. Um, as Isaac and I were getting our bands fit at their local jewelry store in LaGrange, my mom picked out a really nice replacement gold wedding band for my dad. Um, he put it on when she gave it to him, and he's like, yeah, this is nice. How much did it cost? <laughs> and I don't rem remember the exact amount, but he very quickly took it back, went to J.C. Penney, <laughs> and bought one that would just be fine for him. <laughs> And that, to me, like, I'm just, these are the inside, you guys have a lot of outside stories, which I also agree with, but these are the funny, oh man. Yeah, yeah, he never ever got angry. I love those. Um, a couple of the most important and their related observation I've made about my father. And these are, again, confirmations from different things that people have said. He was an amazing listener. He might not have said a lot in response right away, but he would come back to you after a lot of patient thought with his best solution. Having seen him think about other people's situations, I knew well the look that he had in his head when he was preparing to verbalize. You could see his brain churning and he would just, he would have a look where you knew he was about to, something was about to come at you and you didn't know, you didn't really know exactly what it was. But it was something, um, some way that he really thought you could, it would help you, not that you could be better, but that would help you. Um, and really the strongest thing that I'm left with from my dad is that he made people feel noticed and important and appreciated. And that's been the coolest thing that I've heard from pretty much everybody that spoke, is that he listened, he sought people out, he sought everybody out in the room and wanted to make sure uh, that he had kind of touched on anybody, on everybody. And in the first writing he said that he didn't think his life was special to anybody else. And I think we can all agree on that that is kind of ridiculous. I mean, obviously all of you here, but many more than, than could be here. Um, it is incredible how special his life was to so many other people. Um, he asked intentional, intentional questions and he cared, he cared about and remembered the answers. Um, I've gotten messages from people from my, my friends from second grade to now, family members, colleagues, and even acquaintances that have reached out, just acquaintances that have reached out to let me know how important my dad made them feel. Um, and that is, I think that's what I uh, hope to carry on. Another important thing for me to let you know is that we are going to be okay. There is a lot of emotion, but not a ton of pain. Um, my family, my wife and my kids got to spend the last, a lot of the last several years creating memories and saying all the things we wanted to say. My dad said he didn't have any regrets, which makes it easy for us to not have any either. He might not be around to tell all the jokes and fix all the things or give all the advice, but he taught us how to do that and that's how we're gonna be okay. Um, I'm gonna end this with, uh, the day after he died, I wrote something just to let people know on Instagram and Facebook and all that, but I, thought, I felt like this summed it up for me. I lost my best man yesterday. It was an almost five year heavyweight fight. He took more punches than most men could or should. A few years ago, I wrote him a letter on Father's Day I realized we didn't say I love you too much, and I told him that I thought we should start. I'm really glad we did. He wasn't perfect, but he was perfect for us. Tell the people you love that you love them as often as you can. As we often heard when my dad snuck off to bed before us at night, it's time to go.
It's not the company, it's the hour. one's called Happy Birthday, Susan. It is December 10th, 2018 at 3.10 a.m. in Mexico, a time that Julie referred to as the butt crack of dawn. <laughs> today is Susan's 70th. We travel back to Nashville today after a great week. I'm happy to devote some time to the, today to the most significant part of my life, Susan. We've been able to craft a unique and loving relationship together over, uh, sorry, we, we've been able to craft a unique and loving relationship together. It is one that has grown, changed, and developed over 49 years of married life. We've been able to celebrate all the good times and withstand life's worst tragedies in synergistic support. There's no doubt that I am the best possible me because of her love and support. 
The writer Garrison Keillor tells of the Lutheran farmer who loved his wife so much he almost told her. <laughs> I am guilty of not enough I love yous. Susan, I love you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my sister is standing by in case I can't do this, but I'm uh, going to give it my best. Uh, so we started dating when I was 16 and he was 17. It was an arranged relationship <laughs> because my mother decided she liked him for me and invited him, unbeknownst to me, to my 16th surprise birthday party. Now, I knew of him, because we went to the same youth group and we sang in a choir together in high school, uh, but frankly, I wasn't all that interested in him. He was kind of a steady Eddie guy, worked a lot, and uh, quiet and unassuming, as uh, many of you have heard. But as we got to know each other a little bit, I learned that he was um, funny and very loyal and a gentleman, which was severely lacking in many of the guys I dated at that time. And he also had his own car, as you've heard. <laughs> so our dating got serious when we were in a high school play together and had to kiss on stage me in a nightgown. Um, I learned a lot of things about him very early that persisted, much of which you have heard, but I'm going to put my little spin on it and fill in some of the blanks that others have. And it's very interesting to hear people's perspective about things that we did together. Uh, first of all, he demanded loyalty. There were two times early on when he exhibited this behavior. Uh, the first was our very first year of dating. I did not treat him in the way that he wanted to be treated, uh, and so he dumped me <laughs> for a whole year. Uh, yeah, so he ended up going steady. Is Chris Martin in the eye? She didn't come. So he went steady with a Turkish exchange student named Hatisha Bayar. <laughs> and this is them at his senior prom. <laughs> So she became my arch nemesis, and I went on a year-long journey to try to win him back. And he made me grovel. Uh, he, was, he was pretty tough. Um, but uh, obviously, we, uh, we got back together by the end of my um, junior year, going into uh, senior year. So these are pictures. He was at Western Kentucky University. These next two are pictures of us playing around at Western Kentucky where he was a student. I went there with one of my good friends. Um, and then this picture is uh, at uh, Aunt Virginia and Uncle Jim's wedding in August of 67, which is when I was in high school. Um, and then, this is my senior prom, <laughs> where we were uh, actually together. And then uh, the next picture is when we got pinned the young people probably have no clue what that means, but we got pinned in Florida that, that year. So the second time that he demonstrated his demand for loyalty was when we got engaged in December of 1968. Now we were 20, uh, and our plan was that we would finish school and get married in summer of 1970 when I finished nursing school. Well, you've heard kind of the ending of the story. I'm going to fill in a little, few little things here. Keith, on his own, decided that he wanted to move back to Illinois. He was in school in, in Kentucky, and that we should get married a year earlier. Uh, now, this is his idea. Uh, we had no money. We were both in school. Uh, but in his normal fashion, Keith prepared a budget that he presented to both parents about how we were going to make it work, even though we had nothing, <laughs> and actually save money by being married. <laughs> that was his plan. Does that sound like Keith, y'all? Yeah. So the truth be told, I was not ready to get married. 
I was still in school, and I was kind of dazed by all this, but he was a very persuasive salesperson. Now, my mother was not being sold on any of this. Now, you have to remember, my mother was 39 years old, and this was her first child. She was just sure that we would get married, I would get pregnant and quit school, and you know we would never finish our school. So what ensued was a pretty major battle between my mother and Keith, with me in the middle. Uh, my mother turned against Keith and turned the, tried to turn the whole family against Keith by asking questions like Jeff uh, mentioned, um, and also said that none of the family was going to come to the wedding. So I was, at, you know, I was in this war uh, between my mother, with whom I had always been very close, and the man that I had committed my life to. But I felt like the decision was if I chose Keith, I was giving up my family. So it was a tough, tough time for me. Obviously, I chose Keith, and I stood with him to tell my mother it did not go well. Uh, but all turned out very well in the end because, because I showed my commitment to Keith, he backed off, and we compromised by six months, got married, and he became a beloved son and brother. The point is that he is one of the most loyal people I know, and he demanded that of his loved ones. And I think that stubbornness paid off in his journey with cancer. The second thing I learned about Keith early on is that he could do almost anything. You heard that about uh, Peter. So on the left, you see a table that he made for me for my high school graduation. Who does that? <laughs> he did. And a stop sign that he stole from a corner in uh, Kentucky. <clears throat> He could do, he built docks, he built kitchens, he built just about everything and took care of everything in our house. So for the first time in the last year, I've had to hire a handyman to do all the things that Keith used to do because he was unable. And as you have heard, his son has inherited those, uh, those skills. This is the boat dock he built that we were standing on there. Uh, the third thing I learned early on um, about what his priorities were. So this is us at our wedding in December of 1969. Um, we were married in December, and, and so someone at the uh, wedding gave us Orange Bowl tickets because we were going to be on our honeymoon in Miami over the New Year holiday. So it was a wonderful time. I, it was my first college football game. Had a great time. But when we got back to the hotel, we watched the entire game over again on television. <laughs> So this is when I learned that Keith's priorities were sports at any time, any sport. <laughs> that was his priority. The third, or the, the fourth thing I learned about him was, has been referred to by a lot of people. He took an aptitude test when he was in the Army uh, that showed that his towering strength was the ability to take complex information and sort it into very logical, very quick solutions. Now, most of the time, this was a great asset, but he applied it to everything in life. Uh, his logic was maddening sometimes, but uh, whether it was a complex building project or business project, broken relationships, whatever it was, he had a solution because that's the way his logical brain worked. But what was missing from his solution was emotion and uh, feelings. Uh, now, it's very interesting to hear the Hoppy family talk about how he helped them talk about feelings. This is not something he did easily or willingly. So it's interesting that, he, that you remember that about him. Uh, but because he would not let emotion get in the way of his logical brain, he often missed that in his solutions with relationships when he was trying to work with people. The fifth thing I learned was that his sense of humor was one of the most attractive things about him for everybody. Uh, these are just some pictures. This is him dancing with, uh, with my aunt who had polio when she was a child in, in a wheelchair. He took her out for a whirl on the dance floor. Uh, so a number of different things. You guys remember that picture. Where are his pants? <laughs> and this was a Halloween party. Now, he, uh, as you've heard, had a remarkable storytelling story capability, and he even 
graced me with one of his famous one-liners as we transferred him to hospice. And that, that one-liner was the last words he spoke to me. The sixth thing I learned about him is that most people preferred his company to mine. And this was, this was actually quite an asset in all of my business relationships. I don't know if any of my business colleagues are here. They could attest to this. But it didn't really matter if I came. As long as Keith was there, everybody wanted him at their table because he remembered everybody's name. I'm horrible at names. And everybody's kids' names and st told great stories, knew all the sports that I know nothing about. Uh, so I will miss him being my handler and having him make me look good. Uh, the seventh thing I learned, although not until later, is that he's a better wingman than leader. I always thought of him as a leader, but he really preferred being behind people, and he was my biggest cheerleader and support. And then, of course, I learned that he's a man of integrity in everything. N never questioned doing the right thing, often at the um, expense of his own pocketbook in business, but... Um, we all learned from him about how to treat employees, how to treat customers, uh, always doing the right thing. So our, uh, our 40, 50, how many, 49 years of, of marriage were not very different than many people. Um, you know, we had our ups and downs, like, like a lot of people do, lots of joy, lots of adventures, lots of fun. So it would be impossible for me to pick out the highlights uh, but Keith did. We had a family gathering recently, and we went around the circle and said, what's a favorite memory that you have? And his memories were of those years boating on the Illinois River with family. Uh, time spent where we'd pull up on a Friday night and spend the whole weekend uh, just loving, loving family. Uh, anything family-related were, were favorite memories of his. So um, I'm going to just flip through a couple pictures here and then just uh, wrap up by sharing with you maybe a couple things that you didn't know about him. Um, the first is, and, and people have talked about this a little bit, is just the miracle in my mind of how we faced and survived uh, the loss of our daughter. Uh, by the time Julie was diagnosed with melanoma uh, in December of um, 2003, she was already very sick. We just didn't know it. Um, she had a couple rounds of treatment, and then we realized it wasn't working, and we had to face her death, which happened about two and a half months later. Um, actually, the same week that Keith died 15 years later. Both Keith and I were unemployed at the time of Julie's illness. Um, and so when I was offered a very good job in December, we made a family decision that I was going to go to work on behalf of the family and that Keith would stay home. And, and care for Julie. And I had been, uh, she and I had been joined at the hip for months before that as we sought medical treatment for her pain and tried to figure out what was going on with her. So uh, Keith was going to be the caretaker, and, and frankly, this was a role that none of us thought that he could do. <laughs> Julie was freaked out. Mom, no! <laughs> <laughs> but he was a magnificent caretaker. He was her protector, her support, her nurse, everything. Uh, and we were just so wrong. And I love the fact that they got to spend that time together, that, um, that Julie had that bond with him and he with her, and that he felt the honor of serving her in that way. Uh, when I say it was a miracle how we survived, it's because you all know the odds. That when something like that happens in your life, many, many couples don't survive it. Um, and particularly couples as different as Keith and I, um, and compounded by the fact that Keith's mother died at Julie's wake, that you couldn't even write a movie about that. Um, our survival was um, miraculous because of how different we were. He was a guy who was stoic and loath to share feelings. He did sometimes. Uh, he often, in fact, didn't even admit he had any many of the time, but, uh, and I was just the opposite. But when all that happened, uh, with the support of family and friends, we came together as a team. And uh, I always tell people that within a tragedy, there are gifts that you receive as long as you're open and willing to, to see them. And we got so many gifts from so many people in terms of um, relationships and support. But the best one was our relationship and how it strengthened. We developed a grace for each other that we hadn't had before then. And uh, that persisted to the end. We'd never fought. Uh, we rarely had crosswords. 
except when I was driving him. <laughs> <laughs> he did not like me driving him around this last year. So our, I could say that our last 15 years are among our best uh, for, because of that grace that we developed from each other. Which brings me to the very last thing I want to share, and that is, um, you know, uh, Keith was a fighter, you all know. Um, he far outlived the predictions. Jeff, uh, somebody was saying 20%, Paul, I think. Um, you know, the, uh, for stage four esophageal cancer, the five-year survival is 0%. Um, so we knew we were, you know, we knew this day was coming, and we were well prepared for it. Uh, but he lived four and a half years, and and that is remarkable. Um, and that's his stubbornness, and his positive outlook, and uh, his will. Uh, the last three months were very tough, especially for him. Um, but what I'm grateful for is that we had the opportunity, the time but also that we took the opportunity to speak to each other about what was important. We got to say everything, no regrets, but also to hear from him what his goals were. And um, that helped Peter and Isaac and, and us make the right decisions for him, knowing what he wanted. So just a little commercial, talk to your partner, your, your spouse, your family about what you want because you never know when you might need it. And let me tell you, it makes an impossible situation much, much easier. Uh, let's see if I can. I forgot to cut. Um, so one night when I was exhausted, I actually was out of town giving a speech, and I was away from home, rarely, uh, for about 36 hours. And I was tired and frustrated. I sat down and wrote about everything I love about Keith to help me remember why I'm, what I'm, the person that I'm honoring by my care. Um, and there are many of the same things that you've heard about today. He was gracious and generous, funny, but he was also stubborn, quirky, um, frustratingly logical. He didn't show affection with, uh, with others, with hugs and kisses, except for Amelia. And he rarely said, I love you, except Amelia. But he was my everything. And I think Pete said it best, he's not perfect, but he was perfect for us. I so appreciate all of you sitting through our long, we had a lot to say, didn't we? Um, and uh, you're honoring him and the life that he led by being here with us today. Thank you so much. We have, uh, Jeff's gonna wrap us up here. So of course, on behalf of the family, I want to say thank you for coming today. Your presence here, your presence in our lives is what makes it all work and keeps us going. So thank you so much. Um, please stick around, there's food. Hopefully there's food left out there, right? And drinks and of course fellowship and love to share out in the lobby. But before we go, I want to invite you all to join us in a song that Keith loved and speaks for your presence here as friends and for our love of music and our love of you all for being here. So please, uh, do we have the lyrics up there? Excellent. So join us in the song.